magic wood Here in the secret kindergarten The world's best show for kids is starting The secret kindergarten radio show Use your ears and your imagination We're going to play, we're having fun It's me, your host, Gino. And this is the best young children's show right here on Revolution Radio. And now it's Christmas. I was so busy, I nearly missed it. All that fun and family time, presents, songs, dinner time. And if you don't have much in your life, don't worry, never mind. We all have everything we need, our hearts, our minds, our souls, and you and me. So Merry Christmas and let's enjoy our time together. Down here in New Zealand, it's Christmas Eve. And we're going to play a lot of music and we're going to listen to a lot of old stories and we're going to do a super cool activity at the end that I'm going to ask you to get involved in hopefully there are people around in the chat I'm going to read you a poem. I'm just enjoying this music. enough Christmas music. I'm going to read you a poem called Falling Snow. See the pretty snowflakes falling from the sky. On the wall and housetops, soft and thick they lie. On the window ledges, on the branches bare. Now how fast they gather, filling all the air. Look into the garden, where the grass was green. Covered by the snowflakes, not a blade is seen. Now the bare black bushes all look soft and white. Every twig is laden. What a pretty sight. And I only really know snow at Christmas from the movies. Because <laughs> here, it's hot and sunny down here in New Zealand. Let's listen to some music by Nancy Stewart from nancymusic.com. Here we go. Little donkey, come and see the baby Jesus fast asleep. Come, little cow, come and see the baby Jesus fast asleep. Come, little pig, come and see. The baby Jesus fast asleep Come little sparrow, come and see The baby Jesus fast asleep Come little 
Little children, come and see the baby Jesus fast asleep. Night and her eyes were wide open like this. She looked all around, not a thing did she miss. Some little birds perched on the branch of the tree, and they were as quiet as quiet could be. The solemn old owl said, Hoo, 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 and up jumped the bird. And away they all flew Put your arms down by your sides Don't bend your knees Don't bend at all We're gonna do the penguin waddle and walk Now start your walk and stay straight and tall We're doing the penguin waddle and walk We're doing the penguin yourself around we're doing the penguin waddle and walk we're doing the penguin waddle and walk doing the penguin waddle and walk we're doing the penguin waddle and walk Welcome back. We are going to play a Grimm's fairy tale. And I was just wondering, <laughs> did you ever learn a naughty word? Well, I'm certainly not going to teach you one, but I remember <laughs> when I was three years old, my daddy hit his thumb with the hammer. And he said a word I'd never heard before. <laughs> and a few days later, I said, hey, mom. She said, yes, Gino. I said, I learned a word, but I think it might be a naughty word. And she said, don't worry, Gino. You can tell me anything. What was the word that you learned? And I told her the word and I said it perfectly. And she got the wooden spoon and she smacked my bottom. <laughs> oh, and now let's go to the elves and the shoemaker.
The Elves and the Shoemaker From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm There once was a shoemaker, who worked very hard and was very honest, but still he could not earn enough to live upon, and at last all he had in the world was gone, save just leather enough to make one pair of shoes. Then he cut his leather out, all ready to make up the next day meaning to rise early in the morning to his work. His conscience was clear and his heart light amidst all his troubles. So he went peaceably to bed, left all his cares to heaven, and soon fell asleep. In the morning, after he had said his prayers, he set himself down to his work, when to his great wonder there stood the shoes already made upon the table. The good man knew not what to say or think at such an odd thing happening. He looked at the workmanship. There was not one false stitch in the whole job. All was so neat and true that it was quite a masterpiece. The same day a customer came in, and the shoes suited him so well that he willingly paid a price higher than usual for them. And the poor shoemaker, with the money, bought leather enough to make two pairs more. In the evening he cut out the work and went to bed early, that he might get up and begin betimes next day. But he was saved all the trouble, for when he got up in the morning the work was done, ready to his hand. Soon in came buyers, who paid him handsomely for his goods, so that he bought leather enough for four pair more. He cut out the work again overnight, and found it done in the morning as before and so it went on for some time. What was got ready in the evening was always done by daybreak, and the good man soon became thriving and well off again. One evening, about Christmas time, as he and his wife were sitting over the fire chatting together, he said to her, I should like to sit up and watch to-night, that we may see who it is that comes and does my work for me. The wife liked the thought. So they left the light burning, and hid themselves in a corner of the room, behind a curtain that was hung up there, and watched what would happen. As soon as it was midnight, there came in two little naked dwarfs, and they sat themselves upon the shoemaker's bench, took up all the work that was cut out, and began to ply with their little fingers, stitching and rapping and tapping away at such a rate that the shoemaker was all wonder, and could not take his eyes off them. And on they went, till the job was quite done, and the shoes stood ready for use upon the table. This was long before daybreak, and then they bustled away as quick as lightning. The next day the wife said to the shoemaker, "'Those little whites have made us rich, and we ought to be thankful to them, and do them a good turn if we can.' I am quite sorry to see them run about as they do, and indeed it is not very decent, for they have nothing upon their backs to keep off the cold. I'll tell you what, I will make each of them a shirt, and a coat, and a waistcoat, and a pair of pantaloons into the bargain, and do you make each of them a little pair of shoes. The thought pleased the old cobbler very much, and one evening, when all the things were ready, they laid them on the table, instead of the work that they used to cut out, and then went out and hid themselves, to watch what the little elves would do. About midnight in they came, dancing and skipping, hopping round the room, and then went to sit down to their work as usual. But when they saw the clothes lying for them, they laughed and chuckled, and seemed mightily delighted. Then they dressed themselves in the twinkling of an eye, and danced and capered and sprang about as merry as could be, till at last they danced out the door and away over the green. The good couple saw them no more, but everything went well with them from that time forward, as long as they lived. Not sure if the dwarfs really had to be naked in that story, but that's okay. Let's play some music! Jolly old Saint Nicholas, lean your ear this way. Don't you tell a single soul what I'm going to say. 
Christmas Eve will soon be here. Now, you dear old man, whisper what you'll bring to me. Tell me if you can. When the clock is striking twelve, when I'm fast asleep, down the chimney with your pack, softly you will creep. All the stockings you will find hanging in a row. Mine will be the shortest one, you'll be sure to know. Johnny wants a pair of skates, Susie needs a sled. Nelly wants a storybook, one she hasn't read. As for me, I hardly know, so I'll go to rest. Choose for me, dear Santa Claus, what you think is best. That's a bit of a long song. I'm cutting that a little bit short because I want to play a story before the ad break. This one is called The Imp Tree. Santa, Santa Claus. English Fairy Tales by Ernest Rise. The Imp Tree. Once there was a king of Winchester called Orfeo, and dearly, he loved his queen, Herodis. She happened one hot afternoon in summertime to be walking in the orchard when she became very drowsy, and she lay down under an imp tree, and there she fell fast asleep. While she slept, she had a strange dream. She dreamt that two fair knights came to her side, and bade her come quickly with them to speak to their lord and king. But she answered them right boldly that she neither dared nor cared to go with them. So the two knights went away. But very quickly they returned, bringing their king with them, and a thousand knights in his train, and many beauteous ladies dressed in pure white, riding on snow-white steeds. The king had a crown on his head, not of silver or red gold, but all of precious stones that shone like the sun. By his side was led a lady's white palfrey that seemed to be prepared for some rider, 
for its saddle was empty. He commanded that Herodas should be placed upon this white steed, and thereupon the king of fairy and his train of knights and white dames, and Herodas beside him, rode off through a fair country with many flowery meads, fields, forests, and pleasant waters, where stood castles and towers amid the green trees. Fairest of all, on a green terrace overlooking many orchards and rose gardens, stood the fairy king's palace. When he had shown these things to Herodas, he brought her back safe to the elm tree, but he bade her, on pain of death, meet him under the same tree on the morrow. Orfeo, when told the dream, resolved that on the morrow he and a thousand knights should stand armed round the empty tree to protect her from the fairy king. And when the time came, there they stood like a ring of living steel or a hedge of spears to guard Herodas. But in spite of all, she was snatched away under their very eyes. And in vain were all their efforts to see which way she and her fairy captors were gone. Orfeo made search for his lost queen everywhere during many days, but no footstep of her was to be found in upper earth. And then, in sorrow for her and in utter despair, he left his palace at Winchester, gave up his throne, and went into the wilderness, carrying only a harp for companion. With its tunes, as he sang to it, sorrowing for Herodas, the wild beasts were enchanted, and often came round about him, yea, wolf and fox, bear and little squirrel, to hear him play. And there, in the forest, Orfeo, as the old storybook says, often in hot undertides, would see the fairy king besides, the king of fairy with his rout, hunt and ride all round about, with calls and elfin horns that blew and hounds that did reply thereto, but never pulled down heart or doe, and never arrow left the bow. And sometimes he saw the fairy host pass, as if to war, the knights with their swords drawn, stout and fierce of face, and their banners flying. Other times he saw these fairy knights and ladies dance, dressed like geysers, with tabors beating and joyous trumpets blowing. And one day Orfeo saw sixty lovely ladies ride out to the riverside for falconry, each with her falcon on her bare hand, and in the very midst of them, O oh, wonder, rode his lost queen, Herodas. He determined at once to follow them, and after flying their falcons, they returned through the forest at evening to a wild rocky place, where they ride into the rock through a rude cleft overhung with brambles. They ride in, a league and more, till they come to the fairest country ever seen, where it is high midsummer and broad sunlight. In its midst stands a palace of an hundred towers, with walls of crystal and windows coped and arched with gold. All that land was light, because when the night should come, the precious stones in the palace walls gave out a light as bright as noonday. Into this palace hall, Orfeo entered, in the train of the ladies, and saw there the king of fairy on his throne. The king was enraged at first when he saw the strange man enter with his harp, but Orfeo offers to play upon it. And Herodas, when she hears, is filled with longing while the fairy king is so enchanted that he promises to Orfeo any gift he likes to ask out of all the riches of the fairy regions. But Orfeo, to this, has only one word to reply. 
Herodas! The king of fairy thereupon gives her back to Orfeo, and they return in great joy, hand in hand together, through the wilderness to Winchester, where they live and reign together forever afterwards in peace and happiness. But let none who would not be carried away like Herodas to the fairy king's country dare to sleep in the undertide beneath the imp tree. Let's play some music! There was one, there were two, there were three little angels, there were four, there were five, there were six little angels, there were seven, there were eight, there were nine little angels, ten little angels in the
we have another Brothers Grimm story. We're all about the Brothers Grimm stories here. This one is called The Twelve Huntsmen. The Twelve Huntsmen from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. There was once a king's son who had a bride whom he loved very much, and when he was sitting beside her and very happy, news came that his father lay sick unto death and desired to see him once again before his end. Then he said to his beloved, I must now go and leave you. I give you a ring as a remembrance of me. When I am king, I will return and fetch you. So he rode away, and when he reached his father, the latter was dangerously ill and near his death. He said to him, Dear son, I wish to see you once again before my end. Promise me to marry as I wish. And he named a certain king's daughter who was to be his wife. The son was in such trouble that he did not think what he was doing, and said, Yes, dear father, your will shall be done. And thereupon the king shut his eyes and died. When, therefore, the son had been proclaimed king, and the time of mourning was over, he was forced to keep the promise which he had given his father, and caused the king's daughter to be asked in marriage, and she was promised to him. His first betrothed heard of this, and fretted so much about his faithfulness that she nearly died. Then her father said to her, Dearest child, why are you so sad? You shall have whatsoever you will. She thought for a moment, and said, Dear father, I wish for eleven girls exactly like myself in face, figure, and size. The father said, If it be possible, your desire shall be fulfilled. And he caused the search to be made in his whole kingdom, until eleven young maidens were found who exactly resembled his daughter in face, figure, and size. When they came to the king's daughter, she had twelve suits of huntsman's clothes made, all alike, and the eleven maidens had to put on the huntsman's clothes, and she herself put on the twelfth suit. Thereupon she took her leave of her father, and rode away with them, and rode to the court of her former betrothed, whom she loved so dearly. Then she asked if he required any huntsman, and if he would take all of them into his service. The king looked at her, and did not know her. But as they were such handsome fellows, he said, Yes, and that he would willingly take them. And now they were the king's twelve huntsmen. The king, however, had a lion which was a wondrous animal, for he knew all concealed and secret things. It came to pass that one evening he said to the king, You think you have twelve huntsmen? Yes, said the king, they are twelve huntsmen. The lion continued, You are mistaken. They are twelve girls. The king said, That cannot be true. How will you prove that to me? Oh, just let some peas be strewn in the antechamber, answered the lion, and then you will soon see. Men have a firm step, and when they walk over peas, none of them stir. But girls trip and skip and drag their feet and the peas roll about. The king was well pleased with the council, and caused the peas to be strewn. There was, however, a servant of the king's who favored the huntsmen, and when he heard that they were going to be put to this test, he went to them, and repeated everything, and said, The lion wants to make the king believe that you are girls. Then the king's daughter thanked him, and said to her maidens, Show some strength, and step firmly on the peas. So next morning, when the king had the twelve huntsmen called before him, and they came into the antechamber where the peas were lying, they stepped so firmly on them, and had such a strong, sure walk, that not one of the peas either rolled or stirred. Then they went away again, and the king said to the lion, You have lied to me. They walk just like men. The lion said, They have been informed that they were going to be put to the test, and have assumed some strength. Just let twelve spinning-wheels be brought into the antechamber, and they will go to them and be pleased with them, and that is what no man would do. 
The king liked the advice, and had the spinning-wheels placed in the antechamber. But the servant, who was well disposed to the huntsman, went to them, and disclosed the project. So, when they were alone, the king's daughter said to her eleven girls, "'Show some restraint, and do not look round at the spinning-wheels.' And the next morning, when the king had his twelve huntsmen summoned, she went through the antechamber, and never once looked at the spinning-wheels. Then the king again said to the lion, "'You have deceived me. They are men, for they have not looked at the spinning-wheels.' The lion replied, "'They have restrained themselves.' The king, however, would no longer believe the lion. The twelve huntsmen always followed the king to the chase, and his liking for them continually increased. Now it came to pass that once, when they were out hunting, news came that the king's bride was approaching. When the true bride heard that, it hurt her so much that her heart was almost broken, and she fell fainting to the ground. The king thought something had happened to his dear huntsman, ran up to him, wanted to help him, and drew his glove off. Then he saw the ring which he had given to his first bride and when he looked in her face, he recognized her. Then his heart was so touched that he kissed her, and when she opened her eyes, he said, You are mine, and I am yours, and no one in the world can alter that. He sent a messenger to the other bride, and entreated her to return to her own kingdom, for he had a wife already, and someone who had just found an old key did not require a new one. Thereupon the wedding was celebrated, and the lion was again taken into favor, because, after all, he had told the truth. I'd just like to say, well, that's the end of the story anyway. And, you know, I just want to say thanks so much to Revolution Radio for uh, letting, letting me on and doing this show. And I'm really surprised that, you know, there are so many of you that are supportive of the show. Um, you know, I'm appreciative of that, of that, and I'm really grateful. And just thanks so much. And it's really good to be here. And, you know, I feel, you know, a sense of community from you guys. And, you know, I do hope that this reaches... I do hope that this reaches the young children of the world. I've got it out on all the podcast platforms. I got it on my website, thesecretkindergarten.com. And please do donate to Revolution Radio because they're so cool. They just, they do let, you know, if you've got something to say, they let you on and have a go at it. And thanks to them, they gave me a chance. And now I'm really on my path. So thanks so much to everybody out there on Revolution Radio. No matter your views, we're all in this together. We've got the same basic ideas and that's the most important thing right now. So let's stick together. Take care. Love you. Merry Christmas.